We'll turn now to the other part of the literature paper, which is uh, one of the novels. So here we're going to be looking at Of Mice and Men. Obviously, there were a lot of comments about Please Do, Mice of Men, and obviously well, what the perambulations of Do meant, I wasn't really quite sure of. So what I've gone and done here is basically listed about 18 essay plans of things you could be asked and things you might want to write about. So if you find a quote to back up every single one of these points, I can almost guarantee you can answer any question that would come up. Um, and obviously, even if you just remember what the actual points are, then maybe in the exam you can pick out the points then, because uh, a lot of them are quite obvious. So here we go. So the first thing we're going to look at uh, analyzing is the way it's written. So first things first, it's got a lot of dialogue all the way through, which uh, lets us know a lot more about the characters and we hear a lot more of their voices. So we kind of really get um, distinct flavors for each one of them and we see distinct mentality and all of it. Uh, it also allows us to be in touch with the reality of the actual time because obviously they speak with dialect, etc. And this is one of the things that Steinbeck wanted us to be well aware of. Uh, so we actually felt that these were real characters and obviously that's something that goes across uh, a lot of his work as well. And also it puts us there, which actually we'll come to in a little bit because it's a very cinematic feel to this and obviously being with the uh, spending a lot of time with the dialogue with the characters themselves being kind of on their lips or at the edge of their lips um, it really kind of puts us up close with them and this is obviously an intimate study of uh, a bunch of failed people and so that's why we want to be that close so uh, we've also got a cyclical opening in the way it's written so we come back to this uh, at the end nothing and then which that proves is nothing's actually changed so people's lives are as were and basically we end up uh, in the, at the foot of the mountains you know the mountains that have just seen hundreds of people probably come through and suffer the same fate and that's really just a comment on the theme of the book about the American dream its fallacy and how no one can really succeed in such a harsh environment the book's written over a very short space of time which uh, reflects the poem from which the actual title comes from because um, Stein actually based this on a poem called um, To a Mouse where basically uh, when he was working in the field one day he struck through a mouse's house and destroyed it and obviously the mouse was then going to die in winter and he felt bad about it. He wrote the poem and then obviously Steinbeck's taken the idea and actually said that obviously people's lives are destroyed as well. So it's shed over a short space of time so you actually see the spikes in people's lives, the changes and, and just see how life can actually affect people very quickly. Um, we've got loads of vivid descriptions and this is really really important. Obviously all the settings, all the places that we're actually in you, you see some of the words and the adjectives used to describe them and some of the unique metaphors and similes he uses and there's almost like a haunting feel like we're there but sometimes we shouldn't be because we know something bad is going to happen and we come to that in a moment at signpost and ending um, you've got a school of thought which is basically like a, an idea of uh, the idea of realism where basically Steinbeck's trying to put us there almost in a cinema cinematic technique so it's like a camera you know he, he kind of sets us up and then he zooms into the action and then we're kind of there living with the characters so basically we start and then we go in it's not like an omniscient narrator who's quite distant from everything knows everything and then we feel comfortable and safe with him here we're actually in with the characters the whole time so it kind of gives us more of a insight into their failings or, or it should give us an insight into their personalities but obviously in this case it gives us an insight into their failings obviously there's symbolism all the way through which we'll talk about in a second and there's contrast lots to be picked up with light and dark and obviously silence and sound obviously the uh, the, the the way that um Curly's wife comes into the barn at the end, comes to mind, etc. Now you've got this signposted ending. You know something bad's coming, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, should it be? Obviously, that's a question. Some people actually criticise it for being too uh, obvious. You know, there's so much actually building. So, for example, we've got the deaths and and, and uh, Lenny's increasing violence throughout. So we know something's going to come through Lenny because he kills a mouse and then he kills. Uh, he breaks someone's hand. He breaks, sorry, um, Curly's hand. Then he kills a dog. And obviously, obviously, all this is building to show that Lenny's not going to be the safest person to be around. And obviously, we've got the death of the dog, um, Candy's dog in there and obviously the mention of the gun a couple of times so we know that danger's around the corner. And also with the symbols then, what you can actually analyse, you look for light anywhere it says light, then show he was showing the contrast between good and bad or he's showing that hopelessness is coming, this is foreshadowing something, etc. And then the idea of, uh, sorry, actually foreshadowing is actually another word you can use for signposting the ending there. It's just kind of telling us what's coming later. We've also got all the references to the animals and obviously the animals to people, both in uh, Candy's dog and Candy, uh, sorry, Candy's dog and Lenny. And also you've obviously got the death showing that death will actually come later and then you've got colours so most obviously you've got the red of Curly's wife's clothing etc which kind of denotes that she's not going to be a safe person to be around so then we come on to themes then and obviously any of these are quite straightforward if you get an essay on this so loneliness you can obviously look at the characters obviously the way they are and the way they interact with each other there's only one pair of friends in this uh, if you well human pair of friends you've got the setting all the places that she put in obviously we're out there a couple of miles from nowhere in a place called Solidar Solidad which is almost words word for word lonely town you've got the outcome basically the uh, only people that had friends, one human, one canine, uh, they end up with no one at the end, although that obviously can be argued. Um, and the friendships are always challenged. So basically the way Carlson actually wants uh, to get rid of 
Candy's dog. Uh, so obviously that challenges that friendship. And obviously the way the boss actually questions them. You two always travel together to George and Lenny. Again, that's being challenged there. You've got the idea of people trying to stand up for ones themselves at different degrees. So you've got Crooks who tries to stand up very briefly to Curly's wife when he's in the bank house, but obviously falls flat on his face and he remembers his place, unfortunately. You've got Curly's wife who tries to stand up for herself and try and make friends and not be such a lonely person. But again, she actually meets her demise. You've got Lenny who tries to stand up for himself when he actually breaks um, breaks uh, Curly's hand. And actually that seems successful for a while, but unfortunately Lenny's other deficiencies actually bring him down. And then you've got Slim who actually stands up for himself when you've got the Curly's accusations to him. Uh, and basically he just tells him to go and... Uh, excuse me, to go and actually look after his own wife and not stop bothering him. So he actually does manage to stand up for himself. And Slim is quite a unique character through all this. He doesn't actually suffer the same tribulations everyone else does. Move on then to American Dreams. Obviously, you've got John and Lenny's idea of having the ranch and a place of their own and living off the fat of the land. You've got Curly's uh, dream of actually wanting to, Curly's wife's dream, sorry, of actually wanting to be in the movies. You've got Candy's dream of joining, obviously, George and Lenny on theirs. And obviously, you've got Curly's dream of it's not really spoken of. I mean, maybe he's frustrated in the way he is simply because he uh, wanted to be a boxer of some kind and uh, for some reason he is still there maybe it's because of some career change he couldn't help but maybe it's because he just didn't have the bravery to go through it and so spends his time picking on people in, in in at his dad's place where he knows he can do that and all of this obviously is to different levels and you can discuss that uh we've got the theme of the idea of knowing your place in society and obviously crooks being black and disabled and obviously the actual position he has and you've got candy obviously knowing your place um he's really trying to get on the dream with john and because he knows just like his dog soon he will be obsolete and he will be killed in one way or another or sent out but basically he doesn't have much of a future at the ranch you've also got the little breakdown so knowing your place with Lenny because obviously he knows he needs to listen to George and etc etc so he's kind of docile in that way now this is obviously a strange one life as is obviously that's the reality of this is kind of showing a real life because it's something that Steinbeck was really really interested in showing us this really happened to itinerant workers you know they would come they would get their $50 a month they would go spend it on hookers and booze and then just do the same again next month it'd be like living in a terrible version of Groundhog Day and he wanted us to know that life was difficult and there were those who pretended that it was bad and, sorry pretended that it wasn't bad and obviously suffered for it so uh, for example Crooks when he's in his bunkhouse and he actually starts picking on Lenny I mean the, 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 the thing he needs there is a friend but obviously just because it's so he's trying to pretend that he's tough etc um he tries to actually push him away similarly with curly's wife she's actually a not another one of those people where she tries to imagine that she could have actually had a life etc where really she's probably just been used by that person who was claiming to be a director um, obviously you've got the idea of people not helping themselves at all and obviously Crooks does that as mentioned and Curly's wife does that as mentioned but obviously Crooks survives so you've got a different degree of it there whereas Curly's wife actually dies uh, and, and Crooks obviously he's needed at the uh, at the ranch etc so we move on then to the characters because you could get a character a qu a question on characters and this is probably going to be the longest part of this uh, video but it is well worth remembering when you actually come to planning your essays so George is seen as caring to Lenny he obviously has a dream himself he gets annoyed quite quickly and thinks about another life when he's looking after Lenny he's smart because he actually dictates all of Lenny's movements and make sure that he's got a plan B to, so Lenny knows to go to the brush he's cautious when he actually meets Curly for the first time and he knows it's not going to be something very good for him and cautious also over Curly's wife he's needy at times as well and uh, we can see that in the times that he actually hangs around with Slim and the way the conversation he actually has with Slim is kind of he's not it's not like how he talks to anyone else so obviously we know he has a need as that and it's not being the friendship need anyway it's not being satisfied through Lenny we know he can do the right thing even though it's difficult obviously he has to shoot his friend and obviously he goes through the idea of losing a friend or maybe it's a burden obviously that's open to interpretation and then at the end and this is a, another actually rendition of how it could be he actually finds a soulmate so obviously that's down to interpretation moving on to Lenny then obviously Lenny's got a really weak mind and it's actually shown by the fact he can't remember anything um, obviously he's in for the dream and this really means a lot to him and you can actually pick that up from the repetition of how many times George actually says it to him and how much he how many times sorry he wants George to say it to him it's got a very strong body you can see that the way he actually bucks barley and the way he obviously crushes Curly's hand he doesn't understand some very simple things with regards to um, remembering when to talk when not to talk etc and obviously that's a huge huge problem for him he's attracted easily to pretty things and soft things etc obviously just like a child and obviously that represents his baby-like qualities he needs George desperately uh, even though when he has some sense of pride at one point when actually says I'll go off and live in the mountains and maybe also this is quite a sad thing because um, he actually knows it's a bad place for him he actually tries to get out of it he says to George this is a bad place when he actually first sees Curly he wants to go but then George kind of doesn't go with it obviously because they need the money etc um, so in, in this kind of it's like a really really small small white flag being waved there by Lenny he wanted to get out before all this happened but nothing uh, sorry uh, fate obviously 
was going to conspire against them. Um, he loves the simple things, as mentioned again, and obviously that gets him into trouble with the hair, and he's a killer. Um, an accidental killer all the way through, but a killer nonetheless. And obviously that's been signposted the whole way. So there's a lot to mention about him there. Uh, Curly. Curly's angry, obviously. Oh, we see this from the way he's always stomping around looking for people. Um, he's violent. Obviously we know this because he saves one of his hands for his wife, which is uh, probably a reference to slapping. He's not really a man, and obviously that's an interpretation really, because obviously he's still living at his parents' place. Um, basically he, he, he doesn't know how to treat his wife properly. He doesn't actually know how to communicate properly with other people, not like Slim does. And maybe he's jealous of a lot of other people, and that's kind of in the shadows of those people. So he's in the shadows of Lenny strength-wise, and he's in the shadow of Slim in terms of authority, and obviously in the shadow of his father in terms of making making something of himself. He gets his comeuppance when his hand is broken, etc. And obviously he gets his comeuppance through the way that Kurt, his wife actually treats him. She's never around when he's around. Whenever you do see them there, they're always kind of arguing. Um, praise on the weak often. Obviously he tries to do that by um, putting the, uh, p p p sorry, making people scared. And obviously that comes through when he tries it with Carlson, tries it with Slim, obviously tries it with George, and then obviously tries it with Lenny to the detrimental effect. Uh, Curly's wife, she's one of the probably more important characters. Obviously she's got no name for herself, which says a lot about women at the time. Uh, uh, she's lonely she's pretty obviously that's highlighted quite a lot and uh, it's a bad combination probably in this uh, era of literature uh, she's dangerous uh, the way she's spoken about that's always good if you mention anything about curly's wife mention how she's spoken about by the other characters because it's not positive is she misunderstood is she just lonely would she be if she were in a better place would she be a better person is she doing what she needs to survive these are the kind of things you can ask yourself uh, she's very simple obviously and foolish for the fact that she actually pursues um excuse me, pursues other people's attention when she's supposed to be married, which is obviously only going to get her into trouble, um, especially knowing what her husband's like. And she says, knowingly, uh, he's not a nice man. Uh, she's silently regretful, obviously. She kind of comments when she's telling Lenny about her life, etc., and saying what she could have been. Obviously, there's a lot of regret in there, but obviously she's not saying she actually regrets it, but obviously we understand that. She Is she innocent, or does she deserve her death? Uh, obviously, that's again for you to decide, and it's always say, always, always worth mentioning both aspects if it comes up in the essay. And she's ill-remembered. Uh, that's actually quite sad. I mean, her husband doesn't really care. He just wants to go after the killer because he just wants to kill Lenny. But then Candy, when standing over her, he really just has a go at a dead body. And that's actually quite sad. So she's actually ill-remembered at the end there. Now with Crooks, obviously Crooks obviously represents the black contingent, but it's not really a story about racism, and Crooks and even himself, he's just kind of this small like side um, area within the novel, uh, but he's actually got one kind of strange redeeming quality, which uh, was not a quality of his character but in the book he's given, he's actually guaranteed a job, he's the blacksmith there, he actually makes the shoes for the horses, if he doesn't have those, the horses can't go out, no one else can work, so his job is kind of guaranteed, and uh, maybe uh, that's not, that's not, um kind of seen as enough of a strength uh, but also that can be his uh, a prison for him as well in that sense uh, he's obviously in pain he takes his medication but he knows what he's doing with his medication anointments etc he's very smart he's probably one of the few people there that can read but obviously he's the outcast in his bunkhouse he's had bad experiences where people have tried to fight him before and obviously they only invited him in to mock him one Christmas uh, a few Christmases ago his slim hope of actually being part of something is actually dashed when obviously um, Curly's wife comes in and uh, Curly's wife ends the dream and then he just quickly shake, shakes that back and that's actually another interesting thing about Curly's wife. She ends the dream literally for um, um, Lenny and George and Candy, but then she ends the dream in another way for Crooks, just by reminding him of his position. Um, he feels threatened, obviously, just even by the idea. He doesn't really understand Lenny's intentions, and obviously he's threatened by Curly's wife, and he's a visited character. We touch upon him, and we just kind of go to him just to kind of hear this one aspect and come back. He's not really one of the threads of the novel, as it were, but obviously he's one of the most memorable so then we come on to Candy obviously he's very likeable at the beginning obviously very friendly to George and very helpful and obviously he's got similarities to his dog obviously his dog's mangy and old and um, decrepit and so is he and basically you can actually see the, the dog as a metaphor for him and his life's actually going to be shaped he's lonely uh, and then he's bereaved in some ways because of his dog when it's actually taken away from him and then he goes into this catatonic state where he just kind of lays on the bed for ages and then he's offered this hope that he actually overhears uh, and then he, you know he, the world is just bright and again and that's actually a really interesting concept it's just these ideas and obviously the american dream is probably all about just an idea but um it's when everyone's offered these ideas that's actually what makes them feel that like they can do and achieve and actually stretch and go somewhere and um it's just the it, nothing actually changes very much from when he's offered this hope to when the hope is dashed but obviously the the way they can talk about it's gone now um, in fact if you wanted to look at it another way it's actually quite a happy ending george 
loses Lenny, loses his burden. He finds a good friend in Slim. Candy's still got his money. Still obviously got the opportunity of the ranch. So there is that way of reading it, but I think people could be quite cynical if you uh, try to just uh, uh, wipe over Lenny that way. Um, he feels included when he actually makes those two friends, so they're kind of like a, a triplet then. Uh, he finds the body, and it's really important that he actually finds the body because there's not many other characters that could have found the body that would actually give her the space and time to go with what we wanted, to get a reaction, an honest reaction about the, um, the breakdown of the dream, and obviously then something that actually goes and allows Lenny to be killed in a, in a humane question mark way and obviously he has his hopes dashed when he finds the body and lastly then we've got Slim uh, Slim is obviously godlike he's in control the whole way through and there's no one else that's written about the way Slim is Slim is only written about favourably and maybe this is uh, kind of like a hero-like figure it'd be interesting actually if you find out who Slim is based on or who Steinbeck was actually thinking of etc he's knowledgeable at all times he reassures people when there's actually troubles and he asserts himself I mean he asserts himself basically it's kind of his nod or his kind of say so that allows for the dog to be killed uh, uh, etc etc and obviously the, the stable hands are all listening to his instructions when they're actually out working now at the other end of stable at the other end of the spectrum on the barn uh, from uh, sorry on the farm from Crooks he's got a guaranteed job as well and obviously that makes him very important uh, and obviously they maybe have a mutual respect for each other and we do see them kind of interact with each other with respect and obviously at the end uh, we end up a place where obviously he reassures again and maybe has he found the friend he's looking for now in George and has George found the friend in him so if you find quotations for any of those you're you're going to be well ahead of uh, what you want to be doing uh, sorry how you want to be doing in terms of grades uh, but, and when you come to writing your points I mean the best advice I can offer you is obviously look at the um, examples that are there but basically if you do this you're not going to go far wrong plan so obviously just try and remember some of the items that we've discussed here when you come to your essay mention a point give a quotation and then explain the meaning of that quotation and analyze it now there's several things you can analyze and as you uh, analyze some of the language or analyze a link that could be made to another character analyze one of the ideas or themes so that's the things that are actually mentioned up the top here any one of them try and get them in each one of your paragraph a different one obviously is better and also look at how it links to another point in the book somehow because there's lots of kind of connections to be made here and do this obviously as much as you can but if you do it four or five times i can't see any reason why you would uh, why you'd get less than a, a very good grade good luck <laughs>